works quite well. So with, with that being said, I, I think it's 705, Michael, I don't know if you want me to, you know, necessarily wait or anything, but, um, just want to let everyone know who's here so far, uh, with, you know, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, I see a couple of names of folks. I, uh, I know, uh, nice to see you, Ron, uh, you're on here and, um, yeah. And so I would just say, uh, now is just time to, uh, this is kind of just an open, you know, prep session. So if you haven't taken a look yet at the tutorial instructions, um, go ahead and read through those. Um, and we're here to help you if you want need any help getting it up and running, or once you've gotten it up and running and you think it's working, but you're not sure, um, feel free to ask any questions, anything like that. Um, and then at, at 8, 8 a.m. my time uh, here in, in, in about an hour, little less than an hour, we will give kind of the introduction lecture and then we'll go through the exercises. So, and then I do just want to point out that on the tutorial instructions page, there's a link, uh, I think it's a few in a few places to the, the Gitter. So if you haven't used Gitter, it's kind of like a public chat room. And that this is just like a permanent place. People can ask questions. Um, and it kind of is there permanently. So um, if you are, if you ask questions via Zoom chat, we'll see those. Um, but if you do ask them via the Gitter, then everybody gets the benefit from that discussion um, and it'll kind of stay up. So um, that's just kind of a nice, nice feature. And um, it should work for all operating systems. Linux seems to be maybe the fastest solution just because um, fast downward is quite fast to just compile and install. Um, on Windows, I think you have to make sure you get like Visual Studio. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll be doing everything today on Windows. Um, so if you guys have any questions and then uh, yeah, Mac, Mac OS, but um, it's pretty much just using Python and Docker. So, you know, those are pretty platform independent, uh, which is nice. So Ron, that's a good question. I don't know too much about fast downward. I'm not going to claim on it. I'm an expert. Um, all I, all, what I do know is that the current, uh, how we're currently using fast downward is just by calling fast downward.py. So as long as you can call fast downward.py from the command line, it should work. So Ron, maybe I can comment. I don't actually know. I mean, we are the first time developers, but I don't know anything about plan utils, but I know the singularity container and I assume they just use the singularity container we release. And if you run that container as an executable, it will basically run fastdownward.py. So if you take that singularity container and just rename it to fastdownward.py, it might, might or should just work um, as long as the operating systems Still realizes it's executable and knows it needs to be run via uh, Singularity, not Python. So that will work on, on Linux because it's sort of based on the contents on the file. It might not work on Windows because I think it will sort of try to run it under Python rather than Singularity based on the file extension. Uh, that's that's my best guess. Yes, I can probably modify that. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a sim link or something to it. Yeah, so um, it, it is just the singularity image in plan utils. 
and so what what might is it yeah, should should work And I, I will say fast downward is just kind of, I, you know, I had a little bit of experience using it before. So I kind of just picked it as like an off the shelf planner to use. Um, it's the pretty much the first planner we've, we've, we've tried to use here. Um, so uh, there's nothing, I guess there's nothing like big or fundamental about using it for, um, this API. And also we, you know, I, I, once I go into the, the lecture, I'll explain, but, um, this is definitely kind of the first public appearance of this API. <laughs> so, um, and we, one of the organizers got, well, me pretty much got, you know, I, I lost some time last week cause I was sick. So it a little delayed. So we had to modify the tutorial. So, um, just bear with us a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, you know, do do have fast down, you know, running and doing some planning, so. Wow, I had no idea this was named. You had named that. I I saw that was Stone Soup, and then, yeah. and I I heard the general story of like Stone Soup, which is something along the lines of like two people traveling into a village, and then they go around to all the villagers and ask for like different ingredients, and mm -hmm. they provide the stones, and then they make a soup out of everything, and exactly, yeah. it refers to kind of just something where everything. And I I know Dungeon Call Stone Soup is a rogue like that. They talk about everything is like thrown in um, yep. and, uh, but that's, that's so cool. I didn't know that. I always kind of wondered maybe, but uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, I kind of, I knew the story of the, the stone soup story. I think it's like in one of those 
well-known programming books like like maybe the pragmatic programming or, or one of those um so I, I read about it there but dungeon crawl stone soup was really the thing that said yeah cool let's 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 name something after that because what fast down what stone soup was was this portfolio of like tons of different um planning algorithms sort of thrown together into the mix and yeah basically in the same way as uh, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, I think, was like the original dungeon, dungeon Crawl by one guy, sort of open to the community and then sort of pulling in lots of different patches that added stuff and thought it was a, like a nice metaphor for tons of people sort of pulling the things together. I think it's, yeah. it's maybe mentioned it in a footnote in the workshop paper we had on Fast Unwrap Stone Soup, not, not entirely sure. It's neat. I had a look in the in the code that calls fast downward, um, and it looks like it like renaming the singularity image would work for Linux, but it wouldn't work for Windows because there um, the code explicitly uses Python to call fast downward. But you could probably change that by just replacing the uh, fast downward process call and fast downward system call in fast downward planning agent. And then you could put plug in a different or a different um, version of first onward. Or write a little red wrapper script called first onward pi that calls sort of just forwards to the singularity image if you don't want to touch the, mm -hmm. um, the, the existing code. So that that's great, and then you know everyone, you know, if you feel comfortable with uh, modifying the code and and want to add these things, please feel free. Also, I would suggest even anything you do here or in the future um, that you think others might benefit, please, uh, you know, uh, you can you can fork the repository and maybe submit like a pull request or anything or uh, contribute. We're we're definitely you know want to open this up for other people to help contribute if they can. Uh,
Hi, Florian. Um, yes. So once the agent is running, um, yeah, if you just, if you just kill it, it will end the game. And then this is, um, um, something I was going to cover later, but, um, so if you look at, so if you, if you look at like any of the agents, maybe you could just say the flash hour planning agent. If you look at the bottom, um, where actually, let me just move this over for a second. Um, so if you look at the, yeah, if you look at the bottom here, um, see this, my config. So there's actually some settings here and one of them will allow you to, um, well, let me just type it here. So if you do always start new game equals true, if you do that, then it'll keep repeating even if the agent dies or um, yeah, basically if, if, the, if the player dies, it'll just restart a new game. Um, but then if you also set otherwise, so if, yeah, if you set this, that's what happens. In, if you, with the default setting, it will um, just connect to the existing game. Um, but if you wanted to always start a new game, then you can say set my config dot uh, auto start new game equal to true. And if you set that second one, then when it connects whatever game it's in that that is already there, um, it'll exit out of it, basically like abandon the game and, and quit and then it'll restart. And it takes a few seconds um, for it to do this, but you should see a little thing pop up. And then um, the other thing I want to mention for everyone is there is this, um, I think in the quick start instructions, it explains this, but um, when the agent first connects, um, when it's going through the character creation menus, for whatever reason, there's a bug where if you spectate the game too early, it, it sends a bunch of extra data to the API and, and, it, and it breaks it. So you just have to wait a couple seconds for the agent to start playing before you watch it in the browser. Um, and if, if you click too early, you should get a little warning message that just says, you probably spectated too early, just restart and, and give it a couple seconds.
Tôi dậy đi Do you know anything? No. Oh, <coughs> how are you going? Do you know me now? Yeah. I was up because I was in this other room, in the room, and I was like, I think I'm online in Java, that's unusual. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm in Austria, I'm not.
So, uh, Michael Cashmore, um, that question, right. So there's, there's a lot of knowledge, Well, there's just a lot to Dunder Crawl Stone Soup. And so we haven't fully added in all the knowledge. So there is a situation sometimes where the agent may come across like a state feature that we just haven't yet put in the API. Um, and part of the reason for this is that even the wiki is not updated fully. So until we kind of run into issues, uh, or I guess we, we might need to go through the, the game source code, but basically if you can actually just like capture that somewhere and maybe shoot it in an email or post it in the Gitter, then we can add that to the thing. Um, but yeah, it's, we're still kind of, the API isn't fully, I guess, synced up with, uh, the game, at, uh, yeah. So, so that this may happen. And, and if other people run into this, um, just, just let us know. I know, I know. Well, I think this, yes, I think this domain could be great for novelty. So, I mean, I'm making this API just so I can write agents to play this game. <laughs> so, yeah, but you know, not, not quite there yet. So. Oh, you were being constricted by a Python. Um, took me a second to process that because you weren't talking about the language. Yes. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, so uh, actually, was the error message something like light colon constricted and then it didn't know what it was? That's right, unknown status value, light constricted. Okay. Um, you are being constricted by an enemy and will take an increasing amount of damage over time, you are unable to move or blink away. Yeah, let me, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. We, I can post the state into Gitter. That would be great. Uh, yeah, if, Oh, Gabriel. Yeah. Um, or I, I hope I said your name right. Um, correct me if I didn't. Yeah. So the, the light water that should have been fixed. So I, I know, I know you, you were one of the first people to maybe try this out early yesterday. So if you, if you pull the master branch again, it should take care of the water, uh, status effect basically. So we are coming up on eight, uh, eight o'clock, uh, at least in uh, you know my time zone. So uh, which is when we are uh, going to start the introduction lecture. So I might just wait, you know, another minute or two, but then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and if you guys have, even during that, I think we'll have plenty of time. Um, so feel free to chime in with questions. Uh, but just know if you ask technical questions about the code, we may not get a chance to, some of our other organizers are on the, the call here too, but um, if we don't get to your your thing, uh, your, your question, um, we will respond after the, the introduction lecture part of it. So, okay, great. So that, that string after light is what I needed there, um, Michael. So yeah, thank you for posting that. Um,
All right. With that being the case, let me just check to see. Um, yeah. All right. So yeah, we have some of our other organizers on here. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So um, hope we are able to resolve some of your guys' issues. And yeah, and I think Okay, I think everyone can see these slides. Okay, I'm not gonna full screen it just um, because I think this will be a little easier. So uh, welcome everyone to the DCSS AI, AI tutorial, or sorry, DCSS AI wrapper tutorial um, at ICAPS. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting for us to be able to do this. Um, this project has been kind of uh, something that you know I, myself and uh, some of us have been working on for a long time, uh, and so been slowly chipping away at it, and it's finally gotten to this point. So it's it's really exciting for us, and this is definitely the first kind of like real public kind of exposure to the API, um, and so it's very much an early work in progress, um, but we think it's getting close to the point where we can really start to use it in research and other things and, and other people might be able to find it useful. So just want to thank uh, everyone else here for helping with this. Uh, we, we wouldn't have had this tutorial without them. And uh, they've contributed a lot to, um, to the project. Um, so Zora, uh, who if you haven't guessed by the last name is, is also my wife and uh, uh, Michael Floyd at Nexus and Adam Amos Binks at uh, ARA. And you, 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 uh, uh, throughout the tutorial, you'll see them lurking on the chat. So uh, feel free to message them if you have questions or other things. So we have a paper in the Planning and Reinforcement Learning Workshop. Um, the main focus of this paper is the vector and uh, PDDL state representation API that um, we're, we created for um, this. And so that paper goes into a little bit. You'll you'll get some of the you know we'll end up touching on some of that that content here. Um, but we we will have a poster session this Thursday. Um, so if you'd like to stop by that or have any questions, please feel free. So logistics, uh, I think everyone here has hopefully seen the tutorial page. Um, this is a long URL. If you go to the GitHub. And there's a little badge that says kind of docs passing in a like, green thing. If you click that, that'll take you to the documentation. And there's a link there to this tutorial page and also just the rest of the documentation. So um, please ask as many questions. I don't think we're going to be pressed for time or anything like that. So there should be plenty of time. And um, really any question, even if you think it's so simple, um, this is kind of the first time we're, we're getting people to kind of look at this. So, um, you know, all feedback, all questions are, are really uh, helpful for us. And um, the, the Gitter is, is a great place to ask your question. Zoom chat will also work too. So, you know, feedback on the code, the project is wanted. As you guys have seen, if I looked at it, it maybe is, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of still research code. It's still under early active development. Um, uh, if you see something that just, I don't know, seems terrible or whatever, please post a GitHub issue or anything. Also, please feel free to fork it and submit a fix. Um, we've been doing some, uh, live stream codings of the project. So there is a, um, we, we took a little break from that, but, um, we were doing it kind of once a week for about two months. Um, I think the last one was maybe in May. Uh, and so there's a YouTube channel. And I think the code base is now a little farther along than, than the last video there, but um, we're thinking about starting that up again. Um, and we also plan to put some demo videos and other things, maybe even this tutorial we might put on that YouTube channel if, you know, we'll, we'll talk with ICAP to see if that's, that, that's possible. Um, so things may break, as you guys have noticed. Um, DCSS is a complex game, it's a complex domain, and so, um, we've collected a lot of knowledge. So you'll see there, if you do browse the code base, there are some enum, you know, enumeration files that kind of list, for example, all the status effects or all things like that. Um, but then how the game actually represents that, 
um, that's just basically not fully aligned yet. So we're still kind of still, still building it out. Um, if you or your students like this project, you know, please consider using it or contributing. Uh, and uh, especially if there's anything you wish uh, the API supported. Uh, so please let us know. Um, what we hope you'll get out of this tutorial is uh, first and foremost to learn about a new domain for AI research, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. Um, I think it's it's relevant to mention that so Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, which you know I'll go into more detail, but it's a roguelike video game, and these are becoming a little bit more popular, or or maybe just well known in AI research, partly because Facebook AI research has put out uh, a net hack learning environment. Um, now that doesn't support, as, as far as I can tell, the latest version of that doesn't support anything um, symbolic state representations or anything like P2DL, which is one of the goals we want to provide with DCSS AI wrapper. Um, also, NetHack is not the same game as Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. There are, there are some significant differences, but they're still kind of in the same genre. And so I think if, you, if you've never heard of Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, you've never heard of NetHack, um, it is interesting. I think there's, there's been some work and I think there might be some, you know, growing work uh, using, you know, doing AI for these video games. So, and the conclusion with NetHack from Facebook is basically like they couldn't solve it with deep reinforcement learning yet. And so they basically released an open challenge. And so I think Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup is of the same complexity. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to necessarily like completely solve it um, uh, right, right now. Um, but if you prove me wrong, that's a great paper for you and you should publish it. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we want to introduce you to the API, uh, uh, this DCSS AI wrapper. We want to give, give you some hands-on experience with using it and creating simple agents. And uh, we want to give some examples of how the API can be used. So kind of, you know, for AI approaches. So one example of that is using it with fast downward. Um, and also just to go over the code base with you a little bit so you can customize it or contribute if desired and, and hopefully use it for your own research. And it is something where we are hoping to, you know, continue making progress on this um, in, in, you know, consistently over the future. So um, I want to give a, uh, just an advertisement here a little bit, uh, you know, uh, shameless self-plug, I guess is what they call it. Um, so there's a cognitive systems for anticipatory thinking, AAAI fall symposium happening November 4th through 6th. Uh, and one of the challenge problems is dungeon crawl stone soup. And so if you think you have approaches or some research you have now that you think could apply to dungeon crawl stone soup or domains like that, um, we are looking for, um, you know, two to three page abstracts, uh, describing an approach idea, you know, or even a theory for kind of third wave autonomy. Someone mentioned before in the chat, like handling novelty. Um, so I think it's gonna be a really exciting workshop. Um, anticipatory thinking there is kind of just, refers to more than just forecasting. Uh, a lot of times forecasting is just saying, okay, you have some event with some probability, you know, if, if there's some event, what's the probability this event would occur? And just to think, we're trying to go beyond that and think about what are even the possible events that could occur, and also ways of possibly trying to mitigate that. Um, and Justin, so, do you want me to jump in for a quick second? Please, Adam, go ahead. So, so Adam is uh, the lead organizer for Cogsat. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. And thanks, Dustin, for taking over. I had endeavored to get a slide in there about one of the examples that we were thinking about uh, for Dungeon Call Stone Soup, but uh, I've got a new baby and uh, last night didn't go very well. So I was just <laughs> a little behind. Anyway, uh, just to say that um, we're really excited about Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup and uh, a, 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 I guess a solution to the challenge problem that uh, Dustin and I were thinking about. Um, so Actually, let me first give a uh, conceptual definition of anticipatory thinking. It's the deliberate and divergent consideration of relevant possible futures. And so how we think that grounds out in a planning domain is coming up with plans that don't that either uh, don't have or have dead end states, i.e. catastrophic failure states, that are not sibling states to a generated plan. 
we know there's planning systems out there that can generate plans like that already, um, but they, you know, they kind of happen without uh, considering that sibling failure states as a first order object. And so that's kind of one of the things we're looking at in Dungeon Scrawl's Crawlstone Soup. And it's also super interesting because you don't know everything about the domain uh, ahead of time. It's underspecified. So we think anticipatory thinking is a good way to manage risk for uh, a planner when uh, you know the domain is being uh, learned and revealed as you play the game. And that's kind of an exciting idea we have. Um, we welcome a lot of other ideas and uh, there'll be, uh, there's an interesting list of speakers. We've got our speaker list confirmed. Uh, we'd love to see abstract submissions. And if you've got any, uh, uh, any ideas or want to chat with us, uh, please, uh, please reach out. I'll turn it back over to you, Dustin. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so now I'm going to give an introduction to Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. And uh, so for this, I'm just going to um, just kind of play here through the browser. And so um, I guess I, I, I was hoping, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't done something with Zoom like, like this. So I don't, I don't think there's a way we can do a poll, but I was just curious. And maybe if someone, people just want to type like a star in the chat, if they've played Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup or if they know it. Uh, well, I know, you know, at least a couple of people here. Great. Uh, thanks for starting, starting us off there. Uh, yeah. So if anybody, yeah. Okay, cool. So some of you have, have played it. Um, I, I, my guess is that, you know, I think the Nicole Stone Soup is pretty much a, um, it's pretty much a, it's still kind of a, it's not the most popular, most famous game. And so I'm imagining some of you have never played it before and it's quite, uh, I'm actually just gonna quit this game here and start a new one. Uh, so it, it's 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 quite a game in that usually when new players start it and they pick it up, uh, there's a lot to learn. And so oftentimes players will go. There's a pretty active subreddit. There's a wiki. There's even an IRC chat room, um, or like like a you know, public chat that, that people would ask questions in. And the other thing is that it's Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup itself is under active development. So every year, um, so every year, multiple uh, new patches come out. I think they're, I think they're on version, I, it might be close to version 0.3 now. Um, at the time, the, the version that's in the Docker container that you all are using, I think is uh, 0.26. And so, um, you know, they add, they add new character types and new new like gods to worship. That's that's an element of the game and other things. So it's an evolving game. And uh, yeah, so let me just go ahead and start walking you through it. So when you first start, you have to pick uh, your species. So, um, and there's, there's a lot of here and you know, they all have different attributes um, and it gives a little description here. And, but we're gonna, the recommended beginner one is the, is a minotaur. And then you can select your background. Um, and so even though these are grayed out, you can still select them. Um, we're going to go ahead and go with a berserker. So, um, and, and then for some of them, not all of them, you get to choose a starting weapon. So here, let's choose a, a hand axe. And this, this number on the right here, this aptitude, um, there are skills that, depending on your species, um, you have different aptitudes in learning. And basically it means a plus two is pretty good. It means that uh, this species, uh, this, this, the Minotaur will become more skilled, have a higher skill faster uh, with hand axes. And that skill affects, you know, ability to uh, basically fight monsters and, and deal damage and uh, be more accurate. So um, so you start, this is uh, even, a, even a bit unusual. I'm kind of on a, a beach uh, like island uh, here. A lot of times you start in just a regular dungeon, but basically it's, you know, it's a 2D grid world. And uh, up here in the right, you have um, kind of your stats. So you have health, you have magic for casting spells. I actually won't do anything magic here, partly because um, of the God I'm worshiping. So that's, that's a fun, fun concept. Um, 
uh, and I'll explain a little bit more, but so, you know, AC is like your, your defenses, uh, EV is evasion, SH is shield. Uh, and then you have your level and this percentage means um, how much experience you have until your next level. Um, strength, intelligence, dexterity, these affect uh, uh, combat and, and other things. Intelligence is needed for casting magic spells. There, for, for Magic players are, I think, uh, considered a little bit harder than melee focused players in this game. There are a lot of spells. So I think there's over a hundred spells and a lot of these spells require targeting. So not only are you choosing which spell to cast, you're choosing a target for it. Um, and so that's one reason that the action space, at least when it comes to spells and other things can be you know, decently complex in this game. Um, and then place is the dungeon. So in order to complete the game, what's the, the overall objective is you have to navigate through this dungeon, these, these 2D levels, grid worlds, you go downstairs and eventually you find what's called the Orb of Zot. And then you have to come back up and exit the dungeon. Now you have to go through, I think a minimum of 45 levels to do this. And a quick back of the hand you know, calculation, I think most levels have at least 2000 tiles. So it's a lot of tiles you're gonna explore and come across. Um, there's a lot of items that you pick up and other things. So, um, and then just a few more things about the interface. So down here in the bottom left, you have text describing what's happening. And this is partly, you know, the, I think the first version also, Someone, if I say something just totally wrong, someone please chime in. I'm not an expert on this game. I've enjoyed the game myself. I think I've played maybe five to 600 games of which I've only won three or four times, uh, which I think is a pretty good win rate. Uh, so some people play for years and never win. Uh, it's a very difficult game in general. It's very punishing. Um, but anyway, on the bottom, you know, the original version of the game was in ASCII art. It didn't have these kind of graphic tiles. And so um, part of being able to understand what was happening are these, these text messages in the bottom left. And then in the bottom right, um, and you'll see this in the, if you download the game, you won't see this here, but basically there's uh, spectators. So when, when you were watching the agents play, when you were setting this up yourself, you were actually a spectator. And if someone were to come, I mean, I'm playing this locally on my computer, so no one can do this, but um, you could host this on a public facing server. And then if you played, other people can actually watch you play and they can, there's actually a chat box here, um, which is kind of an interesting feature. And then on the right here is a mini map. So that's, that covers the interface. And then if we start moving, um, you collect items. So you can move in the eight cardinal directions, diagonally, east, west, north, south. And if, you know, things that have a green border, you'll automatically pick them up if your auto pickup setting is on. And so we've picked up a few items. And if we press I, we can see our inventory. So that's a big aspect of this game are, are these menus. And that's part of what, from a planning perspective, is a bit interesting because sometimes without accessing these menus, you won't even have certain information. So you can think of accessing these menus as like observation actions. Um, and so with the API, we don't have too much automatic menu interaction working yet, um, as in being able to give a goal to an age. It's not, it's not quite finalized. Um, but once we get to that point, there will be some actions that plan these planning agents or other agents will need to take to just get more information. So then they, they know which action. So for example, well, I'll, I'll give examples later, but so this is the inventory and then um, you can have up to 52 items, you know, 52 because um, all the items in your inventory can have a lowercase letter as an ID or an uppercase letter. Um, and so if you press A, for example, it'll give you a description. And then there's some more actions here. I can unwield this, this item. I can check my skill for it. Uh, I can drop the item, et cetera. So inventory management is an aspect of the game. Um, for things like a scroll, a scroll is a consumable item. So if I press C, um, what's interesting is it has, you know, it says a scroll labeled this at the top. Um, until you read a scroll, you don't know what it is. Once you read it, so I can read it right now if I press R, um, it was a scroll of magic mapping. And so now if I pick up that same scroll again, it'll actually have a magic mapping label uh, rather than just kind of a random string. So, 
There's a few macro commands uh, in the game. So if you press O, it will do an auto explore, uh, which is kind of neat. And so basically it will explore until it finds monsters. And I think some items will also cause it to stop. Um, so if I tried to auto explore again, it'll say, you can't do that. There, there are monsters nearby. Um, and so then there's also an auto fight feature, which is the tab. So people, you'll hear people talking online, like fight, you know, auto, you know, O, you know, O tab or, or just tabbing your way to death is something that people say. Cause if you just auto fight too much, you're not paying attention. You'll get in a situation where you, you won't, won't do well. So I, this is a relatively stronger, relatively strong starting uh, character. So I'm not worried too much. Um, I think if you play as like a human or other things, you have to be really careful in the beginning. Um, but so I've, I've fought these items, sorry, I fought these monsters using auto explore, things like that. And then one of them, one of the monsters was carrying a club and he dropped it. I could pick this up by pressing G. If I check my inventory, it's now there. If I wanted to equip it, I could go to C and uh, press W for wielding. So now I've wielded a new weapon. Um, but, you know, for, for the, my purposes, it's better to, um, you know, use, use an ax. Um, that's just what I'm gonna do. So that is kind of just movement and fighting. And then there's some interesting uh, terrain features, right? So this is a dispersal trap. Um, so if I walk into that, I actually don't know what's gonna happen. But what's interesting about the game is that, so if you press X, you enter, I think what they call observation mode, and then you can describe anything. So I'm moving this cursor, and if you press V, it'll describe it. So this is a corpse of a monster that I killed. Um, and then if I go here, I, I didn't know what a dispersal trap is, so it says, uh, if you step on this, you will translocate uh, yourself and, and anything around you to a new location. Um, and hostile monsters might trigger it. So if you're being chased by a group of monsters, maybe you want to try and come through this hallway and then have them step on it. And then maybe some of them will translocate and you'll be safe. Um, trying not to die is oftentimes the main goal of, of getting through the dungeon. So uh, I talked about the inventory. Uh, I want to talk about uh, skills. So these are all the skills in the game. And so skills have, um, so there's fighting, which affects kind of how much health you have. And I won't go into all of these. Um, there's a lot, most of these, sorry, most of these on the right are magic related. There's some things that have to do with how stealth, you know, how, how quiet you are. Um, and stealthy you are, there's armor related ones, there's different melee or range skills. And your aptitude, um, basically as you kill monsters, you gain experience. The experience then causes your level of the skill if you're training it to increase. And so skill management is extremely important in being able to win the game. A lot of times players, uh, if, they, if they don't do a good job training the right skills, they won't be strong enough to fight certain monsters later in the game and they won't be able to survive. So um, right now it's kind of in, in auto mode. Um, you can see down here, but if you press the forward slash, you can do manual and now you can, you can change these to some degree. So, you know, I'm right now I'm training fighting axes, armor and dodging equally, you know, basically allocating experience 25% each of these. If I want to just do axes, I can press E to turn that on and uh, I can turn armor and dodging off by just selecting those. And now axes goes to 100%. Um, but we'll just, uh, actually just for the purposes, I'll just go back to auto mode. So those are skills. And then um, what else is there? So if you, pr the, your movement speed and attack speed are important in, in determining how well your character is. Um, okay, I see you have a question. Are the mechanics expressions for how things like aptitude contribute to chances to hit damage known? Yes, I believe so. So on the wiki, they, they go into the equations for calculating um, uh, damage uh, and chances to hit. 
and also speed. So time is, a, is an interesting thing. Um, if you look at the top right here, um, 49.7. So there's some characters are faster than others um, and time may progress. So, so I just, I, I didn't, I realized I didn't mention this. Um, nothing happens in Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup unless you move. So you can take as much time as you want to think, which I think is one of the cool things about possibly using planning systems is, or other types of reasoning systems. Um, you could just let it take its time to think if it needs to. And humans do this all the time. They'll step away or they'll even take a screenshot and post it on the subreddit. And I'd be like, what should I do to not die here? And sometimes the answer is you can't do anything. Um, is it turn-based? Yes, it's turn-based. So um, yeah, um, nothing, you know, until I move, nothing happens in the game. Uh, so there's that, there's also, okay. And then let's talk about, okay. So if I press, um, shift, if I basically press percent, the percent sign, like shift five on my keyboard, um, it kind of shows some of your resistances and other things. So our fire is your chance to resist fire, resist cold, resist negative energy, which is some kind of like spells or other things that enemy monsters can cast on you and affect you. So um, I think this, well, there's also magic resist, but there are things where like you can become paralyzed um, or you can be hit for a lot of damage later in the game against certain types of monsters. And these things help uh, make your player resistant to those. Um, so, you know, our, you know, this is resistance to corrosion. And then there are some special attributes you can get from different items. Um, yeah. And then you see here, God. So we started out worshiping a God called Trog. There are uh, a lot there. I th I th there's, a, there's a good number of gods, I, maybe upwards of like 20. And normally if you don't, there's a few starting character backgrounds that if you choose them, you will worship that God. If, you don't have a character that worships a god, or if you start out worshiping a god, you can, if you come across an altar later, you can change gods. And so gods basically give you special abilities. So um, if you press uh, the kind of up arrow symbol, like shift six on my keyboard, you will see the description of the, of the god you're worshiping. Um, so I'm, you know, this is Trog, and gods give you special abilities. So right now, uh, I can go, I basically have a special ability. I can go berserk, which basically for a short period of time, I become really strong and I do more damage. Um, but then after that short period of time, I become slow and more vulnerable. So you have to be careful when you use it. Um, but then uh, you, <laughs> depending on the God that you worship, you basically acquire, uh, 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 probably gonna say this wrong, uh, piety or piety. And the more you have, uh, the more the, you know, this God like favors you and then more abilities you, you get. And um, gods are a major part of the strategy of this game. So usually if you see people talking about online about guides to being able to get far in the game, um, they will talk about, you know, you need this God for the end game to protect you against these types of monsters. Um, and it really does offer a big variety in, in how you can play. Um, and then if you, if you stop worshiping a God, there's wrath. And so some negative actions will happen to your character, um, such as being randomly surrounded by monsters or other things for a period of time until that wrath wears off. Um, okay, so I think I covered a lot of the game. Um, I'm just gonna like, uh, kind of just go quickly through here, right? You, you, there's like, you gain experience when you kill monsters and then these stairs, you can go downstairs. I just picked up an amulet. I might wanna wear it so I could put it on. And then let's, just go down a little farther. There's some special level features, 
there's a lot about the game. I think it would, it would probably take too much time um, to, to show you everything. So, but I would encourage you to play it. And uh, if, if you have any questions, um, yeah, just, just post. So, is that everything? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I won't cover spells um, for now, um, but that's something you could, you could look into as well. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, exit this and we will go back to presentation. So now I'm gonna talk about the Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup uh, AI wrapper. And so even just starting the naming of this, we really have left Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup uh, untouched. So that's partly why we've called it th this AI wrapper. So we're just trying to make um, an, an interface to the game to, al to allow AI agents to play it a little bit easier. Um, the game so far has, until now, has really been designed for humans to play it. Uh, and so there are just a lot of, I think, quality of life things if we want to be able to have planning agents or get certain types of knowledge from the game, et cetera. Um, so uh, it sounds like a lot of people got it working. Uh, so I'm actually, I might do the demo at the end, at the end here. Um, what I want to start with is the code to create an agent. And uh, there's also a page on the uh, read the docs uh, on the documentation online that covers this. Uh, but basically, the way that the API is set up right now is that uh, you need to subclass this agent class. Um, and then the most important thing here is that you have to override this get action function. So um, get action, so the API, when, when you make an agent like this, the API is going to uh, allow that agent to play the game by calling this get action function every time it's, it's you know, you, you, you wanna take an action. So when it does that, it passes in the game state object. And this basically is where, is what has um, the vector and PDDL based API functions and other things. And then you decide what action you want to return. So in this case, it's just randomly choosing, um, but you could call a planner instead. And then that's the action that will be executed by the, um, by the API uh, and sent to the game. And then to act to run an agent, um, there are these two classes, uh, WebSock game. So we are using WebSockets. And just like I was playing in the browser uh, here, this is exactly how the API is playing. So it is just sending, when, when, um, when I go to click uh, Minotaur, my browser is sending a little JSON message to the, the game. That's all the API is doing. Um, so actually, if you were to open up developer tools, and th this is helpful sometimes for debugging. Um, actually, actually, I might just show this just because it is so useful. Um, and if, if you've never seen this before, it's kind of a neat trick for anything WebSockets based. But if I go to web developer tools, network, WebSockets, and then you have to refresh the page a lot of times. Um, to do this. And then we go to WebSockets over here. We click this. It's a few steps. And then we go to response. So then if I press, you know, if I want to move diagonally north, what I've just sent is, is this, this JSON message. Um, and so this is what our API is sending. And all this data coming back is what our, our what our API is basically, um, collecting these messages from the server and then putting together a consistent stable object. So the way that the game works is it's really just sending you updates. It's not sending you complete information every time. So that's, that's one reason why we have this, this game state object is to accumulate it all and keep it kind of all consistent. Um, and so anyway, that's, if you ever run into any fundamental issue um, with it. And even every now and then I come back to, to double check things like this. Um, so, so it's all, over, it's all happening over WebSockets. And 
there is uh let me go ahead and go to uh so i want to show the configuration um so web server config okay that's a bit small maybe this is better uh hopefully can you guys read that okay okay so uh this is this is basically the configuration settings and someone had asked earlier in the in the uh, prep period before we started um this is where we set things. So first of all, this is the IP address and the server port. Um, so I'm I was running Dungeon Crawl Storm through my browser on port 880. This is this is what the Docker container is running. And then when you make an account and register an agent, like you all did when you followed the quick start, the, uh, this is the name and password that the API is using. So you can use any other name and password you want. Just make sure to update these values. Um, delay is something that is. Uh, you can you can play with it. It we've seemed to uh, come across, we've seemed to have issues. I, I haven't been able to lower this this too much. I think uh, putting it at zero point four seems okay on on my machine. Um, any lower than that, there starts to become a, some inconsistencies with um, just uh, data coming from the server and and keeping things consistent. So. Um, it's a work in progress. If you guys figure out a better way, uh, let, let me know. But uh, currently, I, I you know play with this. But if you just know if you lower this value too much, uh, it, you could start to get some inconsistency. Um, then there are the different game modes. So that's something I didn't show, which I do want to show. So um, let me. Okay, so if you hit. So there's two, there's four options here, right? Play trunk. So trunk is the procedure generated full game. If you want, you can play the full game, but instead you enter a seed value and then it will um, basically always generate the same dungeon. Now it's not hundred percent de deterministic. So you won't be guaranteed if like, if you take the exact same sequence of actions through a dungeon generated with the same, like multiple times with the same seed, I do not think that you're guaranteed the exact same behavior. This has to do with, there's, I think there's a whole in-depth discussion about this, um, that the folks who've made this, this game, the crawl, um, have, have looked into. I don't know necessarily like why this is the case, but it just important for you to know, um, So I wonder why this is not. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and then if we, yeah, so, so it will, it will generate, I think most or all of the levels exactly the same. I think some of the monster interactions or other things um, it's not fully guaranteed to be deterministic every time, just, just for, those of you whoever might want to use this for experiments, uh, where you where you absolutely want to make sure that you hold the entire dungeon um, to be the same, uh, it's it may not be possible. Um, right. So that is the. Um, did I stop sharing? I think I stopped sharing. Yeah, you did. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, it turned out the stop share button was right next to um, the tab in the browser. Um, so if we quick quit this, then we will see there's a tutorial. So this is helpful if you've never played the game, there's a, some lessons here and the API uh, supports this. So, um, and the tutorial is the same. And then it explains here kind of what's, what's happening and you can move through. And then 
basically they give you these little goals to get through. Um, so to practice navigating and doing other things. And there's some instructions down here. So this is what the tutorials look like. And then sprints. Sprints are interesting as well. Um, these are kind of pre-made micro um, like dungeons. So it's, it, they're called sprints. And the idea is that it gives you an abbreviated taste of dungeon crawl stone soup. Uh, they're pretty difficult. I haven't spent too much time, but I haven't been able to beat one. And um, it's always the same. And basically each room you, I, you come across like a new monster, um, but it's very challenging. So uh, as you can see, I've been turned into a wisp here um, by this, this monster. And, uh, and I think these are, these are always the same. The room sequence is always the same and the monster sequence is always the same. For, for controlled experiments, um, it may be better to use one of these um, depending on what you're trying to measure. And also you can make your own custom sprints, which is helpful if you wanna design your own levels and things like that. And there's too much to talk about that. Um, but if you guys, yeah, if you shoot me an email or something or when I ask a question, I can go to a little bit more detail about how to make your own levels. Um, okay. And so then I wanted to, so that, that covers these four game modes. And so if you just change this value, then it'll, it'll play a different one of those. And some of them, like the tutorial, the sprint needs an extra, uh, uh, setting, which by default, the tutorial number is set to one. The sprint map is set to a, which is the identifier for the first sprint. Um, and then there are, there's this thing, auto start new game. So this will make it so that uh, if a game ends when the player dies, uh, it will automatically just start a new game. And so it'll kind of just keep going indefinitely. Um, max actions. This is something I added. If you only wanted to run an agent for 500 actions or 1,000 actions and then start another game, um, you can change this to be a, a positive integer, and then that will trigger. Um, and then always start new game. So the API currently will connect into an existing game and you can just start playing there. But if you set this to be true, when the API connects, it always start a fresh game. So if you're in an existing game, it will go through the commands to like basically abandon that character and quit that game. Um, this Aeon Pyth AI Python class, you, this can actually kind of be ignored. Um, and then, uh, and, and the reason this can be ignored is because uh, when you create this website game object, you will actually pass in the agent class. Um, so we, uh, so we, we, you, we don't need to set this. Um, actually, maybe we should even remove that. Uh, right. And then um, the last thing is the species, the background, and the starting weapon. So these are just the strings that match uh, the menu item. So we picked a Minotaur Berserker. If you give it a different option here, it will select these. And then um, if you try to give it something that isn't in the game menu, it uh, should return an error and just tell you. And some, so you, you will always choose a species in a background. You, will, you may not always choose a starting weapon, in which case this just doesn't get used. So it won't cause a problem if, if this is specified. And these, these are all the default values. Um, but here, right here, this my config object, if you just set these values here to be different, then you can customize it based on this agent. Um, so this is a nice way that if you make a bunch of different agents, um, you can have them with all different configurations. Uh, and, then, and then you run. And the important thing here that I, I have to mention is that game.run, this blocks. So no line of code is going to get executed after this game.run. And this partly has to do with just how we have ended up getting the code to run by connecting to the web server. So we're using, we're using this Autobahn uh, library. And um, Honestly, that was a big source of, of the work in getting this API to work to, to, to you know basically work was getting a good connection to the 
the WebSocket. Uh, and so we ended up, yeah, I could, that, it's a long, long pro story there. Um, but we've, what we've ended up to get working pretty well is uh, basically the Audubon library, which is using callback functions. So it's, you know, I wish there was maybe a little bit of better way of doing it. Um, but right now in, you know, Audubon, so under connection, this Audubon game connection, this file is where all of the logic happens, things actually getting sent back and forth to the web server. And um, yeah, so, so navigating in and out of the menus, a lot of the automatic processing. So for example, we will, we will automatically send the enter key whenever there's a backlog of messages in the message queue, which otherwise, if, if a human is playing it, they have to do it themselves. So if you if you ever need, I, I would say maybe avoid looking at this, but this is where all the logic is happening for um, connecting, you know, actually sending the commands to the to the game over the WebSocket connection. Um, and and yeah, so just so you know, after game dot run, no no code is going to run after this. So um, that's one reason why you're creating this agent. This is why we have the API set up as it is. So you can have an agent, you can add a bunch of functions in here, make sure they're getting called and get action and you're good to go. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, it was something that I kind of wanted to set up. Some other APIs have things like you just have a function call, get the state, and another function call, just send an action, and you can do it anywhere you want, however you want. Um, it's not quite like that for this API, just uh, for your awareness. Okay, so I wanna just uh, briefly talk about the code overview and the structure. So these, as some of you I think saw already, there is the source folder, and that has all the source code. So the agents, the web server config, the Autobahn connection, everything I've shown you so far is here. A lot of the enumeration kind of data types are all here. Um, models live here. So including the fast downward model um, that we have. So if you wanted to take a look at that, uh, if you go to the top level here and you go to models, um, uh, fast, I think, I think fast downward simple is what we're using right now. Um, and then I even have <laughs> a couple spreadsheets in here where I was collecting all the data from the wiki and processing that and putting that into like PDDL form. Um, so the PDDL file, actually our workshop paper has as an appendix, this PDDL file, and it's quite long. So uh, if you are just curious, um, but yeah, some raw, more raw representations are here. If, if you wanted to somehow put together your, a different PDDL file, you might find these Excel spreadsheets um, useful. And then this FD temp files directory, this is where the state uh, file gets written um, whenever the planner is getting called. So the game will basically on, on every tick, um, every call of that get action function, the game will write a state.pdl file into this directory, and then the fast downward agent will read it and use that for the latest state. So that is the models directory. And then fast downward, this is just where the, that one fast downward agent is currently looking for the fast downward um, uh, dot pi executable, basically. Um, so Looking just at the at the source code, so in actions, we have action, command, and menu choice. Command is, these are pretty much the objects that are being sent to the server. So they contain the, um, yeah, it's basically an enumeration of all the different actions you can take um, from the game interface perspective. And then agents, so we have some agents um, so far, you, you all have seen some of these um, by, walking through the, the tutorial. And then um, connection, this is the Audubon game connection. I showed that, config.py, I showed that. And there's a little bit, um, a few more things uh, uh, there. And then state. So this is really where a lot of the game uh, knowledge is. So game.py is the big one. That's what has the game state class. Um, and then 
uh, some of these like skill and spell and status effect are kind of enumerations, uh, objects that have a lot of uh, values. Um, and the cell map is the, is the data structure that holds uh, all of the cells, which ends up being organized uh, first by level and then as like a grid. Um, because so in Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, even though it's a grid world, there's kind of three dimensions based on what level you're on. Uh, and so the cell map has all those cells in it. Uh, so with that, that's, that's all the things that we, you know, I wanted to make sure we, we covered. Uh, and with that, I, I thought we would go ahead and move on to some of the exercises. Uh, and, and pretty much the plan from here on out until the end of the tutorial is to leave this slide up and uh, have folks try to go through these and uh, basically ask questions and, and get it started. So uh, yeah, I, I've been talking for a while now. I take, take a break and take any questions and yeah, thanks. I guess I do want to take this point to just ask if there's anyone who has had trouble getting it installed um, and hasn't been able to get the the random agent uh, up and running. Please please let us know and we uh, we can help you work through that. So just as a as a report, uh, two of us had some issues yesterday um, that kind of disappeared upon trying it again, which were a bit weird. So all the steps in the quick start up to um, getting the server running and all these kinds of things worked well. And when we wanted to start the random agent, it, um, it failed both for Florian and me um, when basically we, we started the agent and then it said, I can't import this or that, can't find a module DCSS or something like that, which definitely should have been there. And also worked again after um, I, I sort of clone things again and sort of tried the same stuff again. And so it could be that, uh, so, you know, I, I added this into the quick start yesterday, the step where it's um, pip install dash E and then a dot for the current right. directory. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wonder if that could be the thing, the way that the, um, the way that the code base is organized is um, I'm planning to put this, well, actually an early version, it's not a hundred percent complete yet, but to put it on pip. So you can just do pip install DSS as AI wrapper, uh, and then you don't even have to clone it and you could just make an agent following the, the things. Um, to do that, the way that we structure the code as you can see, the import statements start with DCSS. So they're not relative, mm -hmm. they're more global, mm -hmm. I guess. And so um, if you don't do that, so that pip install dash E dot, I think is needed to handle those. And we, I, we found that problem yesterday and we added mm -hmm. that to the quick start. So if you had seen that before, I wonder if that possibly uh, was the cause. That, that's Quite likely for me, at least, don't know about Florian, because actually when I went through the second time, I wondered if that was a step I missed the first time. I didn't remember it. We added it, yeah. So <laughs> that, that, that all sounds very plausible, but uh, I, I'm not sure if Florian, Florian had quite slightly different symptoms, but may, maybe it was the same thing. I don't know if his 
here at the moment. No, um, it might have been the same for me as well. The same issue. Okay, then this is already fixed. So the best best kind of bug report, I guess. <laughs> I, had a, yeah. I had a similar issue also with this finding and I had to fix my Python version to 3.6 to call it. Okay, thanks. Uh, I know that it needs some, I wasn't sure if it was 3.6 or, or which exactly, but I knew it, I knew it needed some something above uh, a certain minimum number. So um, actually we'll make a note to make sure that's clear. I, I think on the tutorial I said 3.8, but that wasn't, that was a guess. That was not a uh, exact thing. So if you got to work with 3.6, uh, I'll update that as a minimum requirement. I think one one other issue that uh, I ran into was that I had to update wheel in in pip. I think it's pip uh, minus u wheel and pip itself or something like that. I, I can look it up. And so change. yeah, at one point I had kind of run into that issue too. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that. I think I think we will make a note to add something um, about needing you know. Possibly needing to update wheel. Um, I put the line in the chat that I used. Okay, thank you. Do you uh, do you remember what error it was saying? Uh, that when that when you did pip install dash u uh, wheel, Not it fixed exactly, it exactly. But I think it was during the step where you install the requirements, so pip install minus minus r requirements or something like that. Okay. Um, and then the error message, I think it mentioned wheel in some way, but I don't remember what exactly it said. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Hi, Dustin. Could I ask a question about uh, goal management and how you are uh, choosing the goals for the planner? Sure. Uh, and I guess the immediate context for me is I've been uh, watching it run while you're talking and I think my agent has uh, explored the whole level, but it doesn't seem to be looking for the stairway or anything. So I'm curious how you're changing the goals. So that's, that's a good question. I'm going to take this opportunity really quickly to say that um, part of how, part of the fast hour planning agent, um, part of making that was to get the agent moving in a bit more of a directed manner to then use that as kind of almost a tool to flush out the API and, and run into more scenarios where I would catch things and then update the code. Um, and I say that primarily because until now, and, and still right now, the, the primary focus of what we've been working on is to get the API to be consistent. And the agent development has uh, kind of been to serve that purpose rather than um, try, well, I mean, we eventually wanna get there, but, but rather than trying to have a, like really good agents that can play the game. So basically the fast hour planning agent that we had that we have and that I think the, the one that you're running and everything that's kind of just been I mean for lack of a, of a better description kind of like a, a quick and dirty um, planning agent to get it to explore a little bit more interestingly than like a random agent so um, you know I think with that I so I think that's that's really where uh, for folks who are on here if they want to try and see the agent uh, get farther in the dungeon is to change how the goals are given to the planner. Um, and so basically it's nothing fancy. Uh, there's kind of just a, I mean, I can, I can go ahead and go over that uh, quickly. Um, I'd love to see it anyway. Yeah. Let's yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, 
didn't want this to be uh, a focus, um, uh, more just maybe a very initial example of something you could do, but in no means should this be taken as like a, anything like a gold standard or, or, or even a good approach. Um, so, uh, and I know I'm scrolling a bit quickly. I think, I think you all can see that. Okay. So, um, Basically, there's kind of a high-level policy in this goal selection function. Uh, well, first, let's just go to the very top. So, so get action, right? This is what this is the function that's returning the action, and uh, so we're calling goal selection every tick. And the goal selection function is going to say, well, if there are monsters nearby, let's deal with the mon. Let's attack the monsters, and so that will. Um, you know, that basically will call this function to get the first monster goal. Um, and as you could see in the text, I think in the, in the getter Ron Alford, which I will get to that comment, um, he mentioned, uh, it kind of shows up as like not has monster at, at this location. Uh, so that would be the goal that's returned. Otherwise, because there's some stuff commented out here, um, get a random non-visited non-wall, uh, basically tile. So um, in terms of exploration, there's actually a, um, I just saw someone post in the Gitter. I will respond to that in a second. So um, in terms of exploration, uh, I think what we're doing here, I, you know, I kind of wrote the, I've, I've written a few different functions to explore and this was just the latest one that we used. Um, but it's basically getting a random tile that the player has not visited that is not a wall. And I think it's also taking distance into account. So it's kind of, of all the cells that haven't been visited, it's picking one of the ones that are farthest away. Um, and then, and this is, this, this is this is like a magic number. This is like not not good. Um, we we this is like there's a lot of polishing that needs to happen with the API. So just yeah, thank you all for bearing with me. Um, this this four is just a very arbitrary threshold of saying that if there's no if there's no new place to explore, uh, no tile that that we haven't visited that's that's greater than four away, and there are some nearby closed doors. Or sorry, no. There, there, there is a closed door. Let's go visit the closed door and open it. Um, and then, if if that's not the case, then uh, let's let's consider the farthest away. Let's look at um, if there is a, 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 a you know a, a far away cell. We will pick that to be the goal. Uh, and then this is the actual string that is. Uh, given, and then this is actually written into the state.pddl file. This kind of gets sent back to the game state object and um, the planning agent then gets that and, and uh, uses that to operate. Uh, so, and then, so I think there might be, yeah, create plan, yeah, or yeah, can create plan to reach next floor. This function, I don't think is currently being used, but you could try uncommenting this. Um, I haven't tested this recently. Uh, and yeah, part of that is just, we didn't, we were a little behind in, in getting this tutorial, but um, if you could try uncommenting this and trying, and then it, at one point I had tested this and it was working for getting a agent to navigate to the stairs and take the stairs down to the next level. Um, and so I guess that is at least a quick overview. Was that, um, was that helpful at all? It was for me. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank Thanks, you. Michael. <laughs> yeah, Mike, I'm I'm happy to uh, follow up on anything if uh, if you have any other questions. I'm sort of engrossed in it. I still feel that selecting the right goal is really the, the key here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so I'm glad you, I'm glad you made that comment, Michael. This is something I wanted to touch on. So in thinking about Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup and, uh, well, now I have to wait a second for the Zoom <laughs> it's, it likes to overlap the, the tab that I'm on. Okay, so I, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, so while you guys are working on the exercises, just, just want to highlight that the, the nature of the game is such that there's just so much. Un it's procedurally generated. Every time you play, it's going to be different. You really don't know what you're going to come across when you start the game. And so... Uh, all these, this is all black, right? This is all like unexplored. I have no idea what's here. So from an AI agent or a planning perspective, right here, I can maybe what, generate a plan of maybe 10 or 12 actions to get to some of these tiles and that's it. So it's, it's definitely a domain that I think there's some very interesting planning, but uh, I, I think what's, what's really gonna be interesting is it's really kind of planning and executing um, or like, you know, a replanning domain or things of that nature where um, you're, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and after you take a couple of actions, the state is going to change a lot, I think in most cases. And so for that, uh, there's probably going to need to be some infrastructure. Maybe there's some model learning um, because the probability of your actions uh, having different effects. So for example, if you were to fight a monster, there's at least three different states that could result when you fight a monster. When, when you go to like melee attack a monster, there's like three different things that could happen. One is nothing happens, um, except that maybe you get a message at the bottom that says you swung and missed the monster uh, and then time increases. Time, time will always increase when you take that action. Um, so, so nothing could happen. Another thing that could happen is that you damage the monster and now it has less health or you kill the monster and now the monster is no longer there. Uh, now, the probability of those different states when you take that action, depending on the monster and depending on your own uh, characteristics, uh, primarily your skills, what your skill levels are, and also the items that you have equipped, that's going to change that probability. And so... Uh, you know, ideally, I, you know, I think there's, it'll be interesting to have planning agents that have learning components uh, in this that can maybe update those probabilities as time goes on to be able to kind of forward predict their, their uh, success or failure. Um, but yeah, and it, I think just to follow up on your point, Michael, I think a lot of this is going to be about uh, the capabilities outside of just just planning. Um, so managing the goals and uh, maybe learning new things and uh, also considering the types of planning that will take into account observation actions. Um, so I'll, I'll give an example of, of just one observation action that's extremely important. So uh, let me get, okay, so I see a monster here, right? And all I, all the game uh, API is giving us right now is really just enough information to draw this this leopard gecko, uh, and we we got some things. We, we, you know, it hissed angrily. So noise is a thing, and if it, if it gets really loud, other monsters may come find you because they can hear you. Um, but the noise level isn't very high, and so all we really know is there's a there's a leopard gecko that's a monster on this tile. What we don't know is we don't know a lot of things about the monster. So monsters have uh, an AC, EV, SH attributes uh, like the players. And so if we do a 
observation and then we navigate over to this this leopard gecko and we hit enter oh really is that all it says no sorry i pressed the wrong thing um so it'll bring up this menu and it'll say uh it'll tell us it's ac it's ev it's magic resist uh it has you know like zero magic resist pretty good evasion and hc and it says hp about five hp and then it gives us some other things uh, it looks easy, so we shouldn't be too scared of fighting it. Um, it's vulnerable to cold. Uh, it's fast, it's small, and it can attack us for up to five damage. So I didn't, you know, the API, we didn't know that it could attack up to five damage um, until we did this observation action. And so that's just an example of where we get more information. And yeah, um, I think planning with observation actions is, is uh, makes for interesting uh, domains, so. Hi, Dustin. Sorry, I left you hanging a few minutes ago. I was uh, struggling to find the mute button. Um, but uh, so you alluded to this, I think, in your answer to Michael, too. Um, is there a way to save the game state? And that would, I mean, I realize that moving forward, uh, things will diverge, but it would be interesting just to restart, for example, just right now, restart the game, trying out your, uh, your goal uh, management to uh, reach the next level. And then just, you know, there might be some debugging. So it'd be interesting to see it. Uh, start in the same place every time. Is that something I can do? So right now, yeah, that is a little bit, yeah. So um, we do not have the capability to just load a state, uh, kind of any previous state from the game's point of view. And um, part of that has to do with just the fact that our API is really just a wrapper to the game. And I don't think there's anything in the game that for the, at least for the procedurally generated one where you can just like skip ahead, for example, if that's what you're referring to. So already in this example, I've taken, I don't know, 20, 30 actions. Um, I could restart this level with the same seed and then try to get this far. Um, but then there is, you know, there might be some small differences, but it'd probably mostly be the same. Um, so if, I guess, yeah, if you're asking if you can just immediately restart from any specific state you've been in before, the answer is no. Um, yeah, that's what I was, yeah, that's what I was asking. So if you, for example, in your state right there, could you try five different agents starting from exactly the point that you are looking at and see how they behave. So yeah, you can't do it in, yeah, you can't do it here. What I would say is, well, I know this is a little bit of, of work. Um, there, there is a possibility you could do like sprints or, and, and in sprints, you can make your own custom sprints. Um, that mm -hmm. does require a little bit of like manual effort because uh, you have to kind of there's a there's a whole text format for designing your own level uh or sprint and you basically have to write out the dungeon layout using different ascii characters in like a, a text file um so you could do that and then but yeah that's that's pretty much, you, you i think for for all of the game modes you would have to restart from the beginning of that game mode yeah in practice using the seed and starting at the beginning is probably good enough but there's some points where you might be debugging a particular situation. That'd be nice to have a save. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's one reason. Yeah, it's also right. affected my own debugging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Ron, you had. Um, oh, I, I figured it out. It was a, it. It was uh, stuck on the level upgrade, but it, it scrolled off the screen. So I restarted the agent and then it said, oh, you need to level up. It's like, okay, that's, and I, I did that. I, I did it manually and then it kept going from there and I restarted the agent. Oh, okay, great. Okay, great.
Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So I just now saw your message. Um, also, if I say your name wrong, I apologize. Is it Malte? Um, uh, but I see your message. So, uh, oh yeah. So you actually, wow. I think you got affected by the Zot clock, which is a new thing they added. Um, I don't know if you heard about that. So that you used to be, you could take as much time as you wanted on a level, uh, but now there's a Zot clock. So if you take too much time on a level, then you start to get punished for it. And so there's this status effect basically that we didn't yet have in the um, game. I actually know exactly where to update that uh, to fix it. And uh, I, if you just give me one second, I can tell you where that is. Um, Sorry, I was uh, out of the room for a second, but uh, I think I got what you said. Okay, sure. And and, yeah. and I like the other thing. Maybe you mentioned that. So I like with the pip install update stuff. I sort of put the Midera message I got into the Gitter. Thank you. The thing from the chat. And it just looks like like something in the Python in infrastructure was too old. I think it's not finding some kind of pip module or whatever, like like one part of, so it's probably because we were working on too old, or I was working on a too old machine. Okay. Um, so if you'd like a, a quick fix to, um, Yeah, if if you if you um, want to fix, I can go ahead and post something in Gitter, and then later today, even I can I'll update the code to uh, accommodate that. I think for today it's not necessary. I mean, what I saw before okay. that was that it was moving quite quite aimlessly for a while, and and thus was eventually punished. So I think what really should be done, like to make the agent play better, is is, is sort of go down the stairs at some point, which you discussed earlier i mean it was uh, it was not doing any you know it, it, i think it yeah. did the level of monsters and just sort of um it would have just walked around forever i think uh, without without that thing yeah <laughs> yeah so the the potion that turns you into a tree um sometimes it can be helpful i think it increases your hit points but so I, actually i i did drink it so I'm, I'm playing by hand right now to learn the game and i drank it on purpose to survive a fight and it worked now i'm a tree <laughs> yeah if you well so I don't know if I mentioned this, if you press five, you'll like, it's kind of like an auto rest. So you'll rest uh, until something happens, like a monster comes across or you reach full health or a different status effect ends. So if you're just trying to wait, uh, you can just press five to, to speed that up. Or you can also press uh, to wait a single turn, you just press dot. Some goblins have turned up and they're throwing stones at the tree. <laughs> yep. It's definitely the best game.
in the first downward agent is um, looking for unexplored spaces, or is it is it unexplored or unvisited spaces? Because I have the feeling it walks towards places where it's already been. So what it should be doing is um, it's it should be choosing goals that um, I'm just trying to find that here. It should be choosing as goals cells that it has seen uh, but not visited yet. Uh, and I, every time it walks over its cell, it should mark that as visited. Um, it might it might like if you explore most of a room, but except for like one corner, it might still be holding on to that and then go back there. And so it ends up covering a lot of the same territory. Um, so it is by far not the best exploration you would probably want. Um, you have the feeling yeah. it explores a lot of the dungeon or a lot of the level pretty quickly, but then ends up like going towards all of these corners that you mentioned that too, towards all of the single places in each room that it hasn't been yet. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's the current behavior. Um, if you know if you're feeling adventurous, you could uh, you could try to um, see about navigating to stairs, maybe after you traversed a certain number of tiles or something like that. Um, I yes, think so I here... commented that in to, to see if that if that works, but so far it's not been doing that. But it's a random choice, right? So... Yeah, I. This is yeah. This is mostly just me trying to debug a little bit and add some randomness to. Um, yeah, a better condition might be the number of cells visited is is greater than some threshold. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe you might want to add a variable up here to track that. <clears throat> and so um, one of the things that we uh, hope to get to, so we're, we're still kind of refining the API and everything, but um, as you can see here, a lot of this, uh, you know, like de determining how, you know, what the, what the goal would be or things like this, we're, we're actually using some of just the Python objects like the cell map uh, and we have kind of a list of cells and things like that. Um, I think maybe a more, uh, I don't know, pure approach or um, a more, I don't necessarily know the right word, but you know, maybe a more ideal approach would be to just kind of rely on the PDDL state and there's still a little bit of functionality we, we need to add in there. Um, but then ideally you'd have an agent that is just calling, this, this is very much where you want to go, where you have an agent that has, has this game state object and then it's calling like get the PDDL state. And then from that, it's doing some reasoning about the goal and determining, okay, this is the goal I wanna go pursue. Um, I think in more of a, kind of traditional cognitive architecture style approach rather than it feels a little bit like, I don't know, like all of a sudden you just have some domain specific um, uh, kind of infrastructure or knowledge that you're using in this game state. So um, yeah, that, that's where we want to go with it.
So I, I try to force the agent to go down by just having the condition true for, for going down. Um, and if I understand this correctly, it, there wasn't a plan for that. So I think the, the goal it generated was player plays dungeon one. Should, should that be a different dungeon then? So dungeon one, I think is referring to the place. Uh, and so, you know, I might actually try just running this on my own system. Um, I think there's a typo there. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think this will fix what you were just talking about, but it lower S place right where your yeah, cursor is. Yeah, I changed it. Yeah, that should just be placed, I think. Yeah, I figured Florian probably fixed that. <laughs> so it... You see what I'm talking about, Dustin? Oh, yes, yeah. So um, uh, this is this is a great, this is a good point. So I wanna, I'm actually just gonna take this opportunity to explain a little bit about the planning model. I, we have updated the planning model, I think, since we tested this. And so I don't know, this code actually might not quite work. Um, <laughs> so I apologize. Um, so, uh, right, okay. Let me, I'm gonna duplicate this tab. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to uh, models. And so this is the fast, this is the, the, this is the PDDL model. So we have all these different types of terrain. Um, there's a lot of monsters. I think there's 650 types of monsters. Um, there's a lot of status effects. Uh, mutations, oh, yeah, I didn't cover that. Um, your player can get mutated, which often does different things. Sometimes it can be better, sometimes, usually it's worse. Um, these are all the gods. Uh, so I guess there's, yeah, maybe 20-ish gods. Uh, potions, scrolls, spells. Uh, these are all the skills. What am I, I'm trying to find places. So this is a place. Um, these are all the places in the dungeon. I think these are all the places. There's a couple special levels weird we don't have here. Um, there are things like ziggurats and others. There's also some levels that are infinite, <laughs> like the abyss. So technically, Dungeon Crawl Sensitive has an infinite state space because there's a level that just constantly keeps changing. Um, uh, it's, it's very interesting to play. And so if we look at the, um, move, move our attack south, or sorry, let me go to the stairs down action. So travel staircase down. Right, so I think the goal, well, yeah, I think the goal should be player place next to lowest place. So the goal that should be get, being sent um, here should be, yeah, I think it should be player depth plus one here, um, at least while you're in the dungeon. So if you're in the dungeon, if you're in dungeon one, uh, the next lowest place is dungeon two. Uh, and so that might be the problem here. Yeah, I thought so too. I, I put in, um... Uh, maybe that was wrong. Like I put in um, dungeon two instead of player depth. Um, just hard coded um, from you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. But 
taking a look. Are you saying that you, you just replaced this part with uh, uh, just like a hard-coded player place and then dungeon two, underscore two? Uh, well, I did it in the line above, but um, oh, okay. that might be wrong. I think like the player depth is just the one, right? And that, that just should be a two, not dungeon two. So player place would be dungeon and then player depth would be one or two. Yes, yes. Okay, I'll try that. So it should be, so if we are gonna, so if we are basing it off of the fast downward, sorry, not the fast, the, the well, I mean, that's what the file is called, but uh, this PDDL file, then the dungeons, this is, this is what should be the actual place. Dungeon underscore two. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that still didn't work. So I get, we can post this in the chat quickly. I will say, I think uh, oh. So I think the goal looks correct. It's the player plays dungeon two, but then it says no plan generated. You know, let me look into, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll look into that. Um, I'm gonna double check that the stairs are getting written into the state. PDDL file. Um, Can you show where the model is generated? I think that would be interesting in general. Sure. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is one of the things we we are planning to change um, once we finalize the the PDDL API functions. Uh, we should be able to just call those directly. But um, for now, what what's current? Yeah, uh, I will absolutely show that. So if we go to um, So if we go to state, I think, and game.py. So this is um, probably the biggest file. Yeah, there's a lot of documentation. Um, so it looks like, so this function, right, PDDL current state to file is what's being called. Um, and it, it takes the goals here and um, a lot of the data is, is coming from this um, PDDL current state cell map. Um, so the cell map object. Uh, and so you, you may, it could be that it's possibly using local only local cells within a radius of the agent. Um, I don't think that's true just based on the behavior, um, but adding a negative one uh, here might not hurt. Um, that'll just make sure it's calling the, the global function. And 
Also, if you want to inspect it, another way to inspect is to actually go to, so for this, at this point, I will, sh um, I'm gonna switch sharing to my fast downward, or sorry, my, um, the actual code on my computer rather than just showing in the browser. And, um, okay, so hopefully you can read that. And uh, one, one thing you can do is you can go into, uh, you can go into models and you can go to the state PDL. So this is the last state PDL that was written uh, to the file. And so we can search for stairs down. So there are stairs down here. So I, this is one thing I was worried about is whether or not this was being written out. Um, but it is being written out. And I'll check in my version as well. I'm, I'm standing in, in this um, situation. I'm standing close to the stairs. So even if it's within a radius, I think it should show up there. Gotcha. Um, and then if we go to the fast downward, well, I guess just to double check, let's make sure fast hour planning agent. Let's just make sure we're using this model. Yeah, the simple one. Um, so we're using that model. And if we go there and if we find it's travel staircase down. Yeah, players at a cell and that cell has stairs down. And players at the current place and Oh, it's looking for the connected. I wonder. Uh, I think connected might be a thing here. So I saw that in this general DCSS knowledge facts PDDL. Yes. And I mean, I, I can confirm that I, I also have the has stairs down in my model. Okay. Let me just make sure this is used. Um, perhaps we're not using that. So if we go to planning agent, well, actually, I want to I want to check that. Oh, when we call the planner, we write out the state file. And in this function, getting the objects and Oh yeah, general knowledge, PDDL facts, file name. So this is general DCSS knowledge facts, PDDL. So if we look in the state.pdl file, we should see all those connected statements, yeah. So these should be present and this should be enough, I think. Um, Yeah, and then we close it out.
So maybe it's the player place that's missing. I, I see that in state PDDL as a goal, but not in the in the initial state. Oh. Player place. Oh, you're right. It's not in my state. Oh, that might be what's missing. Um, that's a good catch. Let me. Um. So we should be we should be getting in get PDL player info. Uh, Did it change the player at? I think the player place is not getting written. Um, so player pl so player place basically is just saying which place in the dungeon is it at and uh, the naming is is bad unfortunately i i'm referring to dungeon as the whole game but there also is just a type of place called the dungeon which is where you start um versus so there like, is a player at predicate is did it just get changed no no so the player at is the exact cell you're on player place is like the level you're on um maybe player level is a better name for that um, I might make a note about that. Uh, um, and so I think what's happening is that it's not getting written. And so uh, what I think we want to do is just do player PL strings dot append. And then I think we do have player place. So I would consider in game.py try adding this line. Could you copy that into the chat? Sure. Um, thanks. Still not still not working. Um I would ch check to make sure that it's, it's actually getting into state.pdl would be one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I know the problem. 
Uh, it should be this instead. Um, yep, sorry about that. Um, player place is just the name of the place, which is the dungeon. It's, it doesn't also have the level. So um, I'll put it in the chat here. Um, try this line instead. It does look better, but it's still not. It's still not working. Not going down. <laughs> but the player plays dungeon one that now looks good in the in the state. state okay. Player. Does it also just say it can't generate a plan? Yes, exactly. Okay. And it, it prints the goal, and the, the goal looks good with dungeon two. Um, connected is there, the player place is there. So one thing that I have done before is um, if the state.pdl file is being written out and that looks good, you can try just, um, just giving that to fast downward. Uh, separately on the command line. Um, yeah, it's a good not, idea. Not, not sure how much experience you have doing that, uh, but. So I thought I would just take this time to maybe try and work through this uh, live. <laughs> so um, if people want me to put the slides back up or anything, just let me know. Uh, I'm more than happy to do so.
Okay. It looks like um, it's maybe somewhat readable. Um, I realized I need to uh, change the, make sure it can actually navigate to stairs.
Uh, for any f- new folks that may have joined, just want to mention if you uh, have any issue getting things up and running um, or have any other questions, just feel free to chime in. Um, what we're doing right now is um, uh, kind of just working through some exercises and, and playing around with a fast downward planning agent. And uh, yeah, I started to, to try it. Uh, to see if I can get the agent to navigate to the stairs. And so that's what I'm showing here. Um, but if you have any questions about the code base or anything else, uh, you know, please feel free to ask. Uh, yes, Mike, those are, uh, those are negative values, uh, the underscores. All right. Thanks. Before we dive down a rabbit hole, is weapon knowledge anywhere? Are weapon talking, knowledge like like which what weapons are better you know which armor is better which weapons are better no the, yeah we don't really have any of that in here yet yeah we're still still kind of at the point where we want to get the API to where like fully tested to where you can like equip, uh, you know, weapons and armor and use other items. Um, I think, I think we're quite close to that, but yeah, in terms of strategic knowledge in general, um, all of that is probably a, a little farther out and, or maybe something we might not even necessarily provide. Um, I, I guess just to say that, leave it up to like the agent designers to think about uh, what they would do there. That's actually, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, that's often a, a question a lot of people will ask on like subreddits. So if you haven't seen the Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup subreddit, um, it's probably worth checking out if you're interested just to see what people say about it. Um, but frequently people will ask item questions like, should I use this piece of armor versus this one? Um, because a lot of times they have trade-offs and uh, the other thing is that oftentimes, especially when choosing weapons, uh, and, and sometimes is, is an indirect thing, you know, armor, because sometimes the type of armor you have might affect which type of weapons you can use. Um, and so when people, when, when players find it's often, there are like these artifact uh, weapons or ar artifact items that are like special and very good, have like a bunch of uh, bonus attributes on them. And finding those sometimes warrant a complete change in strategy. And that's kind of a difficult decision point is, 
should I, I found this great item? Is it worth it to change how I'm leveling my skills and maybe even how I'm fighting people to adopt it, for example? Is that, is that knowledge in general represented in game in, a, in like a, a semantic format or like, and then converted the text for the player or is it actually just all in, described in text and then executed in code? So I think ultimately, so ultimately I think what, what have there's the attributes, so there's the description of the weapons and then there's the actual attributes. So for example, if certain types of armor will increase your AC value, um, which is like a measure of your phys, I think, def I think all around defense. And, um, but then it might slow your attack speed. And so you can see those things, like when you equip the item, you might see your AC go up and your attack speed go down. And then so that kind of information is in the game, but I, I don't think any of the strategic information is in the game. Um, so I think a lot of that knowledge uh, players just learn themselves and it's, it's not given explicitly. Um, did that answer your question, Ron? I think so. That's a, 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 that poses some, some difficult challenges for, like, for, for the AI. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I think, you know, ultimately I think some type of learning, um, even learning, you know, maybe even symbolic planning models of some kind um, could, you know, is probably a very interesting thing to, to, like an approach to look at, you know, for this domain. Um, but, you know, for example, there's, well, there, there are some pieces of knowledge that are written in kind of like, I think they're written, you know, actually, I don't know. The wiki, the wiki has like guidance. So, it, so if, um, things for like the Minotaur Berserker, which is what's playing right now, this is, the easiest thing to start with. And then there is some knowledge like, so for example, if you have a, a bladed weapon, uh, like a sword or an ax that uh, has the flaming brand on it, then when you fight hydras, um, normal bladed weapons, when you cut off a hydra's head, they have a bunch of heads, uh, multiple heads will grow in its place. But if you have a, a fire branded bladed weapon, it will sear the wound <laughs> is what the game says. And it won't grow any heads, so it'll actually get weaker. Otherwise, when you fight it, it actually will get stronger as you chop off heads. So that kind of knowledge is on the wiki. Um, but in the game, I don't know if there's actually such a message saying like, it's a good idea to fight a Hydra with a bladed weapon maybe maybe in the bladed weapons description it might have that suggestion it's good for fighting hydras but yeah i think from what i've seen online in, in the way people talk about this game and all this stuff there is just a lot of knowledge like strategic and other stuff that players pick up uh from playing Yeah, I realize it's probably not feasible, but it'd be really fun if you could, if you, if your AI, if your agent could run, you know, simulations, you know, use the game engine itself to run, run simulations against enemies that seen before. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. If you, I will say if you download crawl, which is what I'm showing here in a separate window, um, I think there is an extra, so there's some games here that I've been playing a little bit. Um, so I got up to like a level nine here. Um, there are things like the arena. Which I, actually, I don't even know. You can go read about it. Um, let's just do these examples. 99 orc, 
versus the royal jelly. The royal jelly is like a very hard specific monster. Okay, so I guess this is this is like a combat simulator, I guess. Uh, that we're watching here. I, so actually, this is my first time running this. I just kind of read about it before. And yeah. Um, the thing is, is the, the interface to this desktop app, um, it's not, I don't think anything is happening with WebSockets. And so, um, yeah, I, I haven't figured out yet a way to interface with this. So that's just if anyone's curious. Okay, so. Oh, Florian. Yes, I think I know the problem. Um, I think I know the problem. I think it's that here. Um, well, maybe not actually. Hmm. Well, so actually, let's just look at uh, has stairs down is this, and then yeah, I thought uh, I thought so as well that this has a terrain type, but I couldn't see it in the in the state PDDL. But the validator still said it has one, so I have no idea where this comes from. Huh. Yeah, because this cell doesn't seem to have a wall on it. Hmm. Um, I wonder if it could possibly be an inference being made. Uh, with the model somehow. Are you using any axioms or anything like that? Uh, maybe a, a, not, well, other than just, I'm thinking maybe even just a hierarchy based thing. Uh, 
but maybe I guess there's just cell. And then we have terrain. And then for objects, hmm, I guess is stairs. It's just a predicate actually here. Yeah, I, yeah. Hmm. So mine is failing right now, I think. Let me go ahead and just end this. And I know you guys probably can't read this, but yeah, I'm getting a plan cannot be generated. So player place dungeon two. So my state PDL file, yep. Got player play a dungeon too. Hmm. So I'm actually just going to step away for a couple minutes. Um, and, uh, oh, no. Can, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, it said my Zoom crashed, but I guess it's still working. We can also see you. At least I can see you and hear you. Yeah, seems to be working. For okay. And you can see my browser uh, fine? Yes. Uh, yeah, it works. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'd be worried there for a second. Okay. Uh, I'm going to step away for uh, about five minutes, and then I'll be back.
Wow, Florian, uh, that's that's great. Uh, I'm gonna check that out. So from looking at the objects, there's also cells that don't use an underscore at all. So I think there is um, like three ways of writing a cell, one with two underscores and one with one and one with none. So I think what I had done there was uh, I wanted to have <coughs> negative, negative numbers for the X and Y values. And so the underscore before a number is supposed to signify a negative value. Um, I see, so they are just not the same cell? But then, uh, I mean, yeah. that would mean that it's, I'm, I'm just debugging the, the wrong part of that, then, then it's a different issue. Uh, I'm gonna double check the cell naming uh, convention and where that happens. So right here is just where we're giving the cells their names. Um, and so. Uh, I'm currently seeing your screen as black. Not sure if it's on the end Yeah, it's the same for me. Uh, say, say that again, sorry. We, your, your screen is black, so we can't really see. Maybe you can. Try to share again. Oh, sure. Okay. Pierce still black for me. Hmm. Maybe this is what caused. Maybe it was just like a subroutine or something in Zoom that crashed, and it doesn't doesn't like my pie charm. Um. Let me close pie charm and open it again. Or, but I guess it's not, hmm. In this case, I'm just gonna show it through the browser because that seems to be working. So I don't wanna, I'm afraid if I leave, leave the Zoom. So I got, yes, that's- or sorry, I go ahead. Co I got, I'm a co-host at the moment, so probably it will not close, but I'm also not that sure. So if we can avoid leaving, <laughs> it's probably yeah. better. Yeah, let me try that. Um, so I can at I least it's still, still black, unfortunately. Oh, no, no, it's um, oh. no, we see, yes, no, we see, no, and yeah, okay, great. It is. So now you are muted for me. Uh, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I think I might be able to share my entire screen now.
Okay. Okay. This we can see, yes. Okay, great. Um, so is this this is the line where we I'm in um cell.py. So all the naming from the PDDL file should be this. Um Yeah, that makes sense. And I think I was just like the the plan I validated was probably wrong because I um, mixed up the, the underscores. I, I'll try again with the, the correct one. Okay. Um, David, I lost the chat uh, when I reconnected. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if we necessarily need to save that, but I was wondering maybe if you could download it or something or save it. I can try to do it, yes. And maybe it's also in the recording, but I try to download it. Oh, yeah. I think that's. I'm actually, now that I think about it, I, I don't know if we necessarily need it. So we are in the last half hour now. Um, so I guess, yeah, I kind of just wanted to open it up for just discussion. If anybody has, you know, even just their thoughts or general feedback, um, this is the first time uh, kind of we're, we've gotten this, this out in the open, I guess you could say to um, some AI researchers and stuff. And uh, you know, it is it is still kind of early, and we're still working on it. Um, but yeah, I guess you know. Also, just if you liked it, if you didn't like it, if there was something about it, um, yeah, you think could be better or something. Um, we're basically all all ears. So uh, yeah, just um, we we will end at eleven, and so yeah, just feel free to share any any comments you have. So just as a side note, I didn't know the game before, and I have to say the first Stormwood agent is playing better than me already. <laughs> it's it's a hard game, especially if you've never played these types of games before. I had to do a lot of reading on the wiki to be able to get my first win. I tried going down a level manually to see how the agent would do, and it was suddenly it was immediately surrounded by like thirteen. You know, 13 mobs and die. Wow. Yep. Yep. There's a whole, um, just even just deciding how to, um, whether or not to engage in a fight or to back away, that there's a whole lot of reasoning that can be done there. And yeah. <laughs> it's a... What's the, what's the fastest? So there's a delay in there, right? So what's the, what's the fastest number, like, like rate? that you could, you could run through steps. Yeah, so just, um, so there's, there's kind of a longer answer to that. Um, so that delay is kind of just something that I added in there because without a delay, it seemed like I was getting some inconsistencies with um, data being sent to and from the, the web server, whereas you know, what I, what I thought was happening is that maybe we were trying to send the next action before we had finished getting state messages. So it's not the case that we get a single message from the server between every action. We get a variable number of messages from the server between each action. And so basically, I think having that delay allows enough time to go by um, to basically accumulate those messages. And so as long as they're running on the same machine, it should be pretty fast. And I think when I was testing this out on Linux um, earlier, it seemed like it was going faster. So I could maybe lower the delay a little bit, but that, that's why the delay exists. Um, now, um, we, 
at a previous, I, I would say even incarnation of this uh, API, we had running uh, via the terminal in uh, on, on Linux. So if you even go to the, uh, we even have like two um, GIFs, is that, uh, yeah, two, two little, uh, you know, mini videos here showing the agent playing. The top one is what you all are using in the Docker container in the web server. The bottom is actually where it's playing via the terminal. But this uh, is a little bit outdated. So the whole, we, we basically did a whole rewrite of the game connection uh, using the Autobahn library, which we weren't using before. And we haven't yet tested that with the terminal version, but the terminal version, we are communicating the same way, kind of with the same types of messages. It's just uh, much faster um, um, for whatever reason. And so in some early tests way back when, we were able to get, uh, in the ASCII version, we were able to get up to, I think like 500 or a thousand actions per second. Uh, and so, but we haven't, yeah. So that's that's kind of a, a thing we haven't gotten around to doing. I think the plan is now to polish up the API and align it with a game um, and maybe work out a few of these other uh, uh, issues and then, and then basically it might be, it might end up being very simple. Um, it just hasn't really been attempted yet to try to get it on the terminal version. So I guess the short answer is right now, you know, as fast as you can lower that delay without getting, you know, errors, that's kind of the speed you can run it um, when you're running the browser. I do hope that we can get it to a point where we can do 500 to a thousand actions a second. Um, now that may, and that may only be able to work on Linux and not Windows um, because I don't, yeah, as far as I, yeah, I don't know if you can run it in the terminal, like in PowerShell or something on Windows. So I wonder you said that there are a lot of observations and opening the menu and so on. Is there any negative uh, side of looking at everything? Uh, no. So other than it just might take a little bit more, you know, real time or wall clock time. But in terms of the game, nothing, nothing happens. So if, if I log in here and, you know, we play this game, um, you know, if I, uh, let me, let me get to somewhere, I guess, interesting. Let's, let's fall down the shaft here. Uh, let's go down another level. So, okay. Here, if we look, um, and let me actually just change this quickly. So if I look here, so the time is, uh, 1220.5. And if I enter, if I enter observation mode and I, you know, if I move this around, nothing's happening in the game. It's like everything's frozen. And if I press V to pull up this menu, nothing happens. The time is still 1220. If I open my, if I, if I open my, oh, what can I not? Um, Oh, sorry, I was in observation mode. If I open the inventory um, and I like look at an item, nothing happens. Now, if I, certain things will take time, right? So if, if I get on my inventory and I try to take off my armor, um, this takes a couple of turns. So I guess no time has passed yet, um, but it asks me, actually there's a prompt down here that says keep disrobing. And so it, it asks you that if you're changing armor when there's a monster. And if I hit no, okay. So it, but it did turn out that like a time had passed. So yeah, equip using items, I think 
uses time, but otherwise a lot of these menus, if I was gonna open this menu or this menu or this menu, um, like changing your skills, that doesn't um, take any time. So what, what you might see in AI that is gonna make really good decisions all the time, it might just, you might just, if you're watching it, you might just see it be opening a lot of windows. That might be the behavior it goes with. And I, I think that's fine. Yeah, I see. I mean, as a human play, usually you're lazy, right? And you don't want to open everything all the time, but usually it makes sense to gather all the information. Yeah. Have you looked into uh, handling the output of the planner in, uh, you know, in unsuccessful runs in different ways? Uh, not yet. Um, yeah. So yeah. So that's that's the thing. I mean, we really haven't. I think uh, you know a lot of the fun stuff is still ahead of us, uh, especially when it comes to that. So yeah, right now it's just a simple. We just translate the output of the planner into actions and just execute it. And if that doesn't work, you know, that's it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have so many things I, I want to try and uh, run on this and you know, that I think would be interesting. Um, but yeah, I think we still, there's still a little groundwork to be done on the uh, API itself. Right. Well, and it's also the planner API that could be uh, useful to see to get some uh, defined signals about how it failed. Yes, yes. Um, the other thing too is, uh, you know, I had some experience with fast downward, so I had kind of picked that planner um, and, you know, took, we took the effort to construct the planning model. Um, so that, that, that was really kind of one of the contributions of the, the, our workshop paper was just putting together this, this complete or I guess a first maybe pseudo complete uh, model for a lot of the objects in the game and, and types and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, is fast downward maybe the best planner you want to use for all of this? Or maybe you want different settings for fast downward or you want to use other types of planners. That's all possible. And so um, I didn't talk too much, but, you know, um, in game.py, there are some functions for returning the different PDDL state information or, or, as, or returning state information as a vector. And so uh, I think you could write different versions of that. Maybe, maybe one of the next versions of the API um, will have different PDDL numbers, or maybe you want to use like other thing, other non, other description languages other than PDDL. Um, so yeah, I, I hope we add, a, you know, there, I would love this to have a lot of flexibility to use a lot of different tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as so you're saying in game that pie, you've got some switches that allow you to use different representation choices. Um, more just that we've, we've started uh, outlining some of the functions. So if you, I can show here. Um, so for example, get player stats as a vector. Um, uh, this, is, this is a long function, but um, basically you can return all of these values as a vector. And then um, we don't quite have it uh, yet so that you can get the player spells, things like that. But then um, we also wanna have these kind of functions for PDDL. Um, and so, um, you know, we already have PDO. This is just a little bit of like a restructuring to, to wrap the code into this, but eventually we'd have these, you know, get player stats PDDL, the inventory and PDDL and all these things. And so then in the agent's code, it can just call game dot get player stats PDDL. Um, and what I was suggesting in what I was just saying is that you could just add additional functions here instead of PDDL, it gives you it in like another description language, um, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. And then the agent can just choose what it wants. Yeah. Or I mean, I mean, when you write the agent, you can right. have it used differently. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah.
And just uh, just to mention it, um, I know some folks might be joining from China and they might not have access to, uh, let me uh, change this. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, let me, let me just give me a second to pull this up. We have a YouTube channel um, where um, I've done some live coding as I work on the API um, in case folks find that interesting. Um, it's also a place where if you, if you were interested or ever stopped by while we were doing that, um, you could ask questions and other things. And so um, we're planning to pick that up again um, and we'd, we'd post the details um, somewhere on like the GitHub page. Um, So, and we have some videos here. Um, so if anybody might find that interesting. Um, and then uh, I guess the only other thing I might wanna show before we wrap up here is just the um, documentation. So this is kind of the documentation so far, and we're, we're still updating this. And so you guys all saw the quick start instructions. This is where it talks about creating an agent. Um, we plan to add some more documentation here about the different uh, representations. Um, we've already started that for these, these vector-based representations. Uh, and then, yeah. Um, I, I would just say, yeah, don't, don't be shy if you're at all interested in contributing or playing around with it. And um, yeah, uh, thanks for coming to the tutorial. Yeah, thanks, Dustin. That was uh, really fun. I look, uh, hope that I can get some time to play with it some more. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I, I do just want to, if Florian is still here, just curious if he ever made any progress on that, <laughs> that thorny uh, bug. I don't know if, uh, yeah. I was just writing about it. I'm, I didn't um, find a solution yet, but I'm, I'm still looking. I'll let you know when I find something. Cool, that'd be great. Thanks for the tutorial. <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you all for uh, being patient with us as, uh, yeah, the first time we're demoing it and stuff. So we'll, uh, you know, we'll hang around for another five minutes or so, and uh, we'll, we'll probably end it around 10.55, well, my time, 10.55 in about five minutes. And um, yeah, also, yeah, thanks, thanks, Malte. Um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, we, this is a project I'm passionate about, and I, you know, want to just continue uh, working on uh, for a while. So Maybe we'll try and do another one of these at the next ICAPS. Um, so, oh, one thing I didn't mention for those of you sticking around is that, um, so what's really cool is that because we can offer both vector-based representations and PDDL, I thought that it might be uh, a great domain for comparing different reinforcement learning techniques to planning techniques and specifically, what I'm really curious about is being able to run experiments that precisely 
could precisely measure the impact that knowledge has. So for, for some folks in the cognitive systems community, there's, there's and, you, and you hear about this when people talk about AI, they talk about, um, you know, humans have some knowledge. If you add just a little bit of knowledge into a system, it can make it like a lot better. Well, I think in Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, it's one of those domains where we can look at completely knowledge-free approaches that are just using maybe just the vector representations without any other ex extra info. Um, and then we could look at maybe, maybe very light PDDL models all the way on a spectrum to maybe very heavy knowledge rich PDDL models and we could measure performance. And I think it'd be so cool to be able to precisely say adding this action model makes the agent perform this much better on average. Um, I feel like I haven't seen too much work being able to carry out those kinds of experiments. So that's one of the things I'm really excited about this. I think we can throw a lot of different AI approaches at it and be able to compare them. All right, thank you everybody. I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up here. Um, hopefully uh, the recording will be posted and, and we can put it out there. Um, David, do you, uh, yeah, is there anything we need to do or? Not that I know, I, I saved the chat before and I will do it again. And yeah, otherwise I think the recording will be on the cloud, hopefully. Okay. It sounds great. Um, so prob sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so probably we should just, or I think you can also stop it, right? The recording and then probably can close the meeting. Okay. Um.